Thank you, Gary. Um, as Cheryl noted, I'm Lisa Muras. I'm a registered dietitian and a certified diabetes care and education specialist um, in the outpatient diabetes and nutrition department at um, DHC Health here in Arlington. So really happy to be with you all today. I'm going to go ahead and bring up my slides. Um, we are going to be talking about fiber today. And hopefully we'll give you some good information that you can um, you know, take from this presentation and, and put into practice um, you know, to help improve your health. So our objective today is to first define dietary fiber, learn a little bit more about what that exactly means. Um, hopefully you'll be able to describe some of the benefits of fiber to our health, um, list some options for fiber and about how much you want to consume each day. And then we're going to talk about some ways to increase fiber in your diet, hopefully some practical tips and um, tricks that you can put into place. So starting with a, a definition of fiber, this is from the Institute of Medicine in, in 2002. Um, sometimes we refer to fiber as bulk or roughage, but the formal definition um, from the IOM it's an edible component of carbohydrate and lignin naturally found in plant foods, as well as functional fibers that are extracted from plants or synthetically made and are non-digestible with a beneficial health effect in humans. So kind of a long wordy definition. Um, what we really want to take away from this is that one fiber comes from plants. You're not going to obtain fiber from any animal foods such as um, meat or dairy products. You're only going to get those from plant foods. And that fiber has benefits. Um, it has very um, diverse benefits to our health. Um, so by making sure we're consuming enough fiber in our diet, we can really reap those benefits and help reduce the risk for some chronic conditions. So that's kind of the two main things I want you to remember from that, you know, kind of long, easy definition from IOM. Within the um, area of fiber, we can categorize it in a few different ways. Um, scientists are going to categorize it based on things like solubility, viscosity, fermentability, and prebiotic properties. We're going to talk about it a little more specifically in terms of soluble and insoluble fiber. So with soluble fiber, basically it is going to be attracting water, the fiber, when, when we um, eat it, and it's going to turn into a gel during the digestive process. So this gel is going to help slow down digestion. And what that does is it allows those fibers, which are not digested by the small intestine, it's going to allow it to travel to the large intestine where we're going to have some fermentation. Um, we'll talk a little more about that fermentation and some of the benefits there. Um, but that's what's going on with soluble fiber. With um, soluble fiber, it's going to include things called pectins, inulin, oleofructose, and beta-glucans. You probably think of oatmeal um, as an example of fiber, and that is an example of soluble fiber, probably one of the most um, successful marketing <laughs> of fiber as a health benefit it is under oatmeal or oats. Um, you think of the Cheerios box, it's got that, that benefit there. So that's a type of soluble fiber. Insoluble fiber is going to add bulk to the stool, which is going to help speed the passage of food through um, the digestive tract. Some types of soluble fiber are cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. So with many foods, we're going to have a combination of both soluble and insoluble. You're going to have some foods that are more soluble fiber and less insoluble, and some that are the opposite. But many foods are going to have a little bit of both types of fiber. Um, so both are going to provide a lot of benefits um, to our health through that digestive process. So talking a little bit more about those fermentable fibers. What's going on with fermentable fibers is that they are going into the large intestine and we're starting to have some digestion by the bacteria that are in the gut. You may have heard a little bit about um, some of the new research on gut health. Um, fiber is playing a really big role there. When we are thinking about ways to improve our gut health, fiber is absolutely key. It's one of the main things that we need to have um, a diverse amount to really get those benefits to our gut. So basically, fiber is acting as food for these um, microbiomes and these uh, microbes within our gut. When these microbes start digesting the fiber, they're going to produce some short-chain fatty acids, which turn into butyrate. And that's going to be fuel for our intestinal cells. 
So butyrate has a lot of benefits um, to the human body. It's been shown to help reduce the, um, the, the idea of pathogens. It's going to help um, reduce, uh, improve the resistance to those pathogens uh, by lowering inflammation in the intestinal cells. And this is in turn is going to help reduce blood pressure by reducing that inflammation, um, decreasing the risk of colorectal cancer and cardiovascular disease, and in many cases can also help improve blood sugar, particularly for people with diabetes. So you can see this, you know, kind of busy diagram down there, basically showing um, an experiment in a study that was done in 2022 that by having a high fiber diet, which we're often going to find um, in things like a Mediterranean style of diet, that's going to increase the production of these short chain fatty acids, which again are going to produce butyrate, which is going to provide some of those health benefits there. So again, fiber is being fermented in the gut. It's acting as food for those microbes, producing this um, healthy fatty acid, which is going to in turn have many health benefits there. So when I say fiber is really critical in terms of our gut health, that's exactly what's going on there. Um, it is providing that food and producing some benefits with that digestive process. So talking a little more about some of the other benefits of fiber. Um, with soluble fiber, it is going to bind to some of the fatty acids in the intestine and then remove them through the body. It's going to carry them out of the body, which is going to help reduce our bad cholesterol, our, our LDL or bad cholesterol. It's also going to help reduce the risk of heart disease. And that, again, is going to be through decreasing inflammation and help reducing cholesterol, too. Um, can improve blood sugar control. That is related to the fact that since fiber isn't fully digested by the body, um, it kind of slows down that whole digestive process, which again will help um, the pancreas make some insulin and help regulate that blood sugar a little bit better. With my patients who have diabetes, we're always encouraging higher fiber foods because of that very beneficial effect. Um, I often tell my patients fiber basically blunts the rise in your blood sugar. So it gives your body some time to kind of catch up and start bringing down um, the, those blood sugars. Uh, from carbohydrate sources there. Fiber also helps with satiety, so it helps us feel full between meals. You might often think about protein as something that helps with satiety, and that's definitely true, but fiber, since it isn't digested by the body, it's going to keep us full between meals. So that's always something to assess when you're thinking about your foods and your meals. Am I having adequate fiber if I'm often feeling hungry pretty soon after a meal? Um, having a higher fiber diet can help with that satiety. Insoluble fiber, because it is adding some bulk to the stool, it, um, it's doing that by absorbing water. This acts as sort of a more natural stool softener, which can help improve that uh, motility in the gut. This can help re relieve hemorrhoids because we aren't having, you know, again, those harder stools, um, prevent constipation and diverticulitis. It also can help reduce the risk of colon cancer because we're, again, having that increased motility um, and, and really smoothing out um, that whole process there. So some sources of, of these two types of fiber are the soluble and insoluble. Um, again, as I mentioned before, when we think of soluble fiber, oat bran or oats is, is really probably a, a very popular one. Um, legumes, um, which are things like lentils or chickpeas, those are going to be a good source of soluble fiber. Barley, a whole grain, is going to be a source of a soluble fiber. And then many other fruits and vegetables there. Just to kind of give you um, a couple of examples, um, two to four grams of soluble fiber is considered to be a good source. So half a cup of oatmeal would be a good source of soluble fiber, half a cup of lentils, a medium cooked artichoke, or half a cup of cooked Brussels sprouts. Those are all examples of soluble fiber. Insoluble fiber is going to include things such as um, nuts and seeds. So we see one ounce of almonds or a quarter cup of sunflower seeds. It's also going to include things like your fruit and vegetable peels, um, many whole grains, such as that half a cup of quinoa, and then some of those leafy greens. Um, one cup of kale would be a good source of insoluble fiber. As I said before, many food sources are going to have both soluble and insoluble fiber. So if you think about something like an apple, um, the peel on the apple is going to be a source of insoluble fiber, whereas the interior, the fleshy part of the apple, is going to be higher in soluble fiber. So we're often going to have those combinations. And I wouldn't worry too much about, well, do I need to get more soluble or do I need to get more insoluble? What you really want to think about is having plenty of plant foods in your diet. So that's having lots of those fruits and vegetables, whole grains, um, legumes and beans, nuts and seeds, 
all of those are going to be great sources of both soluble and insoluble fiber. Um, so we're still going to have those benefits by having a diverse diet. So functional fibers are manufactured fibers. These are something that a manufacturer is going to add to a product. Um, an example of that would be psyllium husk, which is what we find in Metamucil, um, polyols, which are sugar alcohols, and then a very popular functional fiber is inulin um, that comes from chicory root. So I've got a little picture here of some protein bars, and that's where we're often going to find some of these functional fibers. They're being added to many foods, particular things like protein drinks or protein bars. Um, I've seen them even in things like ice cream, you know, <laughs> being added to a lot of products now. Um, they do provide benefits to our health. Um, they are going to be a source of prebiotics, which is food or, or substrates for those microbes in our gut. And that's going to allow those microbes to expand their populations and become more diverse because that's going to provide more benefits. So with now, having... Are, are all uh, soluble fibers fermentable or you know, how do we know? You, you talked about the benefits of fiber, of fiber being fermented in the gut. How do we know which ones are and which ones aren't? Yeah, so, so most um, soluble fibers are going to be fermentable fibers for the most part, yes. Um, there are a few insoluble fibers that, that are fermented in the gut, but for the most part, it is going to be more those soluble fibers. They are provide the, the, those um, food for, for the, the gut microbiomes. So, um, again, wanting to think about having that diversity in our diet because we don't want to have just soluble fiber um, because, again, that insoluble fiber is also going to provide some benefits there. But in terms of gut health, it is more the soluble fibers. Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that we have found to be beneficial with some of these functional fibers, again, is that that microbial diversity and expanding that, that population of the microbes. It's also been shown in some studies to help reduce weight gain over time, so helping um, with our, our weight maintenance. And that is related to, again, having just a, a very diverse gut and having a very um, robust digestive process um, can help reduce that likelihood of putting on some extra weight. It's also re related to some of that um, reduced inflammation that we're going to see with having a, a good source of soluble and insoluble um, fiber in our diet as well. So recommendations for fiber, um, for the population, it is recommended for women 25 grams per day and for men 30 grams per day. We'll talk a little more specifics in the next slide, but that's the general recommendation. Um, just to kind of give you an example of that, so you can kind of think about what that looks like in terms of real foods. Um, if we look at a, a day of meals, so here at breakfast, we've got one cup of rolled oats cooked, half a cup of blueberries with one quarter cup of chopped walnuts. That's going to provide about eight grams of fiber there. For lunch, we've got a slice of whole wheat bread, half a cup of raw carrots, and two tablespoons of hummus, so about five grams of fiber with our lunch there. And then for our snack, a small apple with a tablespoon of peanut butter, four grams of fiber. And then finally for dinner, half a cup of quinoa and one cup of steamed broccoli, about eight grams of fiber. So that's going to bring us to 25 for the day. Um, so he, as you can see, it doesn't have to be, oh, I've got to eat, you know, giant salads for every meal, or I've got to take a bunch of supplements or anything like that. This can be done um, through just yeah. having more yeah. of this plant food. Um, having more of those um, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, and things of that nature throughout the day. Um, so we certainly can achieve that fiber recommendation by thinking about our choices and making sure that we're including those fruits and vegetables throughout the day. So within the 2020 to 2025 dietary guidelines, the recommended fiber yeah. intake um, just a bit um, by age group. So for women ages 51 and up, um, recommendation is 22.4 grams of fiber per day. For men ages 51 and up, 28 grams of fiber per day. So a common question I get is, well, why does fiber go down as we get older? It seems like, um, you know, it's a little strange that we should be consuming slightly less fiber um, as we get older. Um, that is based on a, a bit of research that is um, concerned about weight loss with seniors. Um, so the idea that if, if there is too high of an intake of fiber um, throughout the day, that might displace some protein and some fats, and that might cause um, some weight loss there. Um, it's pretty minute differences there, so, so I wouldn't concern yourself too much about like that. Um, it's not a, really a case where we can have um, too much fiber. There, there is some you know, um, health issues where 
we would want to have a lower fiber diet, particularly might be something that's been um, recommended for certain health conditions. Um, but generally, you know, we're not too concerned about, you know, I'm eating closer to 25 grams rather than 22 grams. It's going to be a rather small difference there. Um, but that is why it is recommended as a slightly less fiber intake for older adults as opposed to younger adults there. Within these guidelines, um, this is, is based on a lot of research. The Dietary Guidelines for Americans convene every five years and look at the nutrition um, research and, and make their recommendations. So they were looking at some of those benefits um, from fiber and found that those who ate the most fiber reduced the risk of death from heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, um, and or colon cancer by as much as 24% um, versus those who ate very little fiber. So with the addition, addition of additional fiber um, within the diet, those risks decreased even more. So again, that's how we came up with these recommendations um, for fiber and the benefits of consuming a higher fiber diet. So here's a few more examples of ways to get fiber throughout the day. Um, looking at breakfast, we talked a little bit about oatmeal earlier and how that's a good source of soluble fiber. But in this example, you can see that we're also adding some of those um, more insoluble fiber components. We're adding some of those um, seeds in there with the flax seeds and chia seeds. Um, berries is going to be a, a source of um, mostly soluble fiber. Almonds is going to be more insoluble fiber. So again, a really nice mix there. Um, so that's a way to have sort of a combination of both good types of fiber and, um, you know, really going to be a very high fiber breakfast there with about 17 grams. Um, something like the avocado toast, um, just one way of increasing fiber in your diet is by swapping out things like butter on your toast for something like avocado, which is going to be much higher in fiber. Um, so that's going to be um, a way to add a little bit more, adding even some, you know, vegetables like the spinach and the tomatoes to that is going to add some more. So again, another high fiber breakfast choice. And then we can have a combination here. So with the yogurt, you know, that's going to be um, more of an animal protein, so not going to have any fiber, but we can add some fiber to that yogurt parfait that we're creating here with some flax seeds, chia seeds, um, almonds, and then some fruit to increase that fiber. So a good way to really get in that fiber at breakfast. Lunch options. Um, huge fan of beans. Um, not only are they a really great source of fiber, they're also a good source of plant protein. And we're going to talk a little more about some of those benefits of beans um, in this presentation. So that's going to be this, be this bean and vegetable soup, a good way to get some fiber in. Having a quinoa stir fry, um, quinoa is going to be a great source of fiber. It's also going to be a good source of plant protein because it's technically a seed. So that's a, a way to increase that fiber. And then even having something like nachos, um, not really a health food maybe, but if we're doing something along the lines of those whole wheat tortilla chips, I'm going to give you a few grams of fiber and then adding things like beans, um, avocado, some of those um, tomatoes, that's going to add more fiber. And then a few examples for dinner, um, adding those, those vegetables with our chicken or with our salmon and something like lentil soup is going to be a great source of fiber as well. So as I said, we'll talk a little more about beans, but I, I think you probably can see from this, um, you know, uh, screen right here is that beans are going to be a really, really good source of fiber. Um, and, and a small package is going to provide a really big punch in terms of that increased fiber within our diet. Lisa, we've got a few questions piling up if you want to take a break Absolutely. and address some yeah. of them. Uh, one of them was, can you talk about the difference between Metamucil and Benefiber? Yeah, if, if I could hold off on that one for just a, okay. a little bit, I am going to get into um, supplements and talk a little bit about that one. Um, so if, if that's okay, maybe just to table that for a few minutes, we'll definitely come back and, and get that one answered. Are leafy vegetables sources of soluble fiber? Leafy vegetables are tending to be a little more on the insoluble fiber side. Um, so something like kale or, or um, mustard greens, um, you know, going to have some soluble fiber in them, but those tend to be a little more on the insoluble fiber. Um, but a really good source of um, roughage, I always think of the word roughage when I think of kale. <laughs> it, it just seems to really uh, define that, that kind of term. Um, going to be a, a great source of that, that insoluble fiber, which, as we discussed earlier, is going to help with that, that most utility um, in our digestive tract and with keeping us regular. So for the cereal eaters among us, are mm -hmm. there any recommendations as to breakfast cereals that are especially high in fiber? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think with um, the breakfast cereals, what you're looking for just sort of give you a couple of numbers is, is trying to get at least five grams of fiber 
per serving. Um, we'll take a look at a nutrition facts label in just a minute, but you do want to remember that, you know, you need to look at the serving size on, on that nutrition facts label. But if you can find one that's got at least five grams of fiber um, per serving, that's going to be a great start there. Um, Sources that tend to be a little bit higher are going to be bran. Um, so typically anything like a, a raisin bran or an all bran or some type of bran flakes are going to be very high in fiber. Where you're not going to find a lot of fiber with breakfast cereals are going to be more ones that are made with um, rice because those are typically made with, with some type of either rice flour or um, even, you know, kind of a white rice versus a brown rice. Not that you can't find ones made with brown rice, but they do tend, if you think of Special K or you think of Rice Krispies, those tend to be um, more um, a, a rice flour or a puffed rice. Those are going to be very low in fiber, so, so not going to be the greatest choice. Tend to be low calorie, tend to be low in sugar, but um, not going to be a really great source of fiber there. So I would gear more toward the, grand, uh, the brand um, types of cereals. And another thing to note is when you're looking at that ingredient list for cereals, you want to always see, you know, the first ingredient is whole or 100% whole um, some type of grain, so whole wheat, um, whole corn, um, you know, whole bran, something like that, because that's going to be a really great source of fiber. It's including the entire um, entire uh, germ there, so that's going to be what we want to see. Are there any potential issues with consuming <clears throat> more fiber than the recommended amount for your age group? So the, the, the biggest risk, um, outside of a few exceptions, um, there are some health conditions where it is recommended to have a little bit of a lower fiber diet. Um, but if that's not the case, um, the biggest risk of having too much fiber in your diet is um, kind of some of those side effects that, that we think of with fiber. And we'll talk a little bit about ways of reducing those side effects, but often they are gastrointestinal. So we're going to have perhaps some bloating, gas. Um, you know, things of that nature, maybe even some um, abdominal distension, you know, that type of thing. Um, so that is probably a side effect of having too much fiber in your diet. And in those cases, you know, that might be something to assess in terms of um, how much you're having per serving. So you might want to spread it out more over the course of the day if you are noticing some of those, those gastrointestinal side effects. Um, generally, that's going to be the biggest risk is having a little too much fiber in our diet. In my experience, in most cases, it's adding too much fiber too quickly is what causes those side effects versus um, just a high fiber in diet in general. Um, the other thing, um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in just a bit, is um, there are some types of fermentable fibers, um, which are known as high FODMAP foods, that people sometimes have issues with um, in terms of digestion. Um, so that can be a, a case where you might want to work with um, a dietitian to identify some of those foods if you really find you're having a lot of side effects um, and you think it might be related to some of the, the um, fermentable fibers in your diet. Okay, uh, next question is can you explain the difference between prebiotics and probiotics? Sure, yeah. So prebiotics are the food um, for the microbes in our gut. So the, they are going to be good sources of food so that those microbes can um, multiply and, and grow. Um, probiotics are more um, fermentable foods. So an example of a probiotic would be something like yogurt, which is not a type of fiber, but it has been fermented, um, you know, and it has some of the um, beneficial bacteria in them. Um, another example would be something like sauerkraut, or if you're familiar with um, kimchi, which is found in a lot of Korean foods. Those are fermentable foods, um, and they are probiotics, which mean they are providing health benefits by that fermentation process there. So prebiotics are the food, and then probiotics are kind of more um, the, the foods that have been created to provide some probiotic benefits, which, again, can also help with, with gut diversity and can also help with many of those benefits we discussed earlier as far as reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease, um, reducing the risk for colorectal cancer, um, improving health outcomes in general. Okay, and our last question is, uh, what about whole wheat? For example, uh, wheat bread, Wheaties, even Triscuits that, you know, are made with whole wheat. Is that a good source of fiber? Yes, yes. Those whole grains are an excellent source of fiber. Um, and as we were talking about with those breakfast cereals earlier, looking for um, cereals that are made from whole grains. With the whole grain, you're getting the, the entire um, wheat kernel and you're, you're getting all the, the beneficial parts of it. Whereas with um, a more um, refined grain, so something like white rice, 
um, a lot of that, those nutrients have been stripped away, including the fiber. So we're not going to have as much fiber in those types of things. We're basically left just with the starch. So very little fiber in those things made with um, more of the simple carbohydrates like the, the white rice um, would be a good example of that. So yes, whole grains are a, a really good source of fiber. Are there any whole grains that are not a good source of fiber or is it just any whole grain is going to be a good thing to have? Yeah, for the most part, anyone is going to be a, a good thing to have. I mean, you might find some that are a little bit higher than others, um, you know, for serving size, but pretty much any whole grain is going to be a good thing to have. And it is good um, just in terms of that diversity and making sure we're getting, you know, good sources of nutrients to vary your whole grain. So not just always eating brown rice, but sometimes having some barley, which is a whole grain or bulgur. Faro, um, we talked about quinoa earlier, um, that, that technically is a seed, but we consider it to be um, along the lines of a whole grain. So having a lot of different sources of that are going to provide um, you with a lot of benefits. Okay, and our last question is, uh, what high fiber ingredients besides wheat can be a problem for somebody who's gluten intolerant? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so we can still have adequate fiber even if we do have, um, you know, either a gluten intolerance or sensitivity there. Um, you know, with that, there, there are certain types of um, uh, uh, gluten foods that you're going to be avoiding. You mentioned the wheat and, and, and barley would be another one. But we are still going to get, um, you know, fiber from all of those plant foods, which, which are going to be gluten-free. Um, so it's really just the grains you're going to want to take a little closer look at and be careful if, if you need to avoid some of those foods that contain the gluten. Um, since gluten is a type of protein, um, we're not going to find it in, in many of those fruits and vegetables. So you can still get plenty of fiber in your diet um, by concentrating on those, even if you are trying to avoid wheat. Okay, uh, oh, another question just came in. Yeah. Regarding pesticides on grains and veggies, would you recommend that people buy organic or is, you know, how do, how do we know what to avoid? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, when we think about, you know, pesticides, you know, uh, you may have heard of, of the dirty dozen before. So those are the um, fruits and vegetables that tend to be highest in pesticides. And those are the ones I often recommend to people if you are going to buy organic, that, that's a good place to buy it. So an example of that would be strawberries. Strawberries are kind of on the, the list of the dirty dozen. Um, foods that are what are called kind of the clean 15, which are ones that are very low in pesticides. But those are typically ones that we're going to be more peeling. So a banana would be an example of that. Um, you're not eating the peel on a banana. So it, it isn't quite as beneficial to buy organic organic in that case, as it would be with something like strawberries or peaches, um, which if they have been sprayed, um, it's going to just get right into the fruit. Within whole grains, um, again, I, I think it's, it's sort of thinking about um, where are the risks there. And generally, pesticides are not something that we're going to find as much um, as a high risk with some of those whole grains. Um, certainly, if it fits your budget, it, it, it doesn't hurt. It means, you know, those foods are, are going to have a, a less likelihood of having higher amounts of those. But generally, I, I always look at it in terms of more of those foods that we're consuming directly, such as the, the fruits or vegetables that may have higher um, pesticide residue on them, whereas some of those more um, somewhat processed foods, even with the whole grains, are going to have a, a lower amount on them. Okay, well, I think that's all the questions we've got for now. Okay, sure, sure. We can definitely address them um, as they come in. Um, so there was some data from the American Gut Project, which is kind of looking at, at our gut and, and some of the benefits of um, those plant foods on it. Um, found that people who had um, a diet containing 30 or more different plant foods per week had much more diversity in their gut microbiome than those that consume fewer than 10 um, different plant versions. Um, so they, they came up with this seven-day challenge um, to think about trying to increase those um, plant foods in your diet. So having 30 different plants in seven days, uh, fruits, vegetables, um, and then, of course, that's going to include your um, beans and legumes, your nuts and your seeds, um, soy foods like tofu, grains, any of those um, plant-based foods. Um, on average, most people only eat about five different plants per week. So if you really want to take on a challenge, um, see if you can do this, 30 different plants in seven days. And remember that everything counts. Um, so not only are we counting, you know, the 
fruits and vegetables, which you probably think about when you think about plant foods, we're still counting those beans, we're counting those nuts and seeds, you're even counting things like you know, cilantro or parsley that you have in your foods. Those are all plants. Um, so again, a little challenge for you just to see if you can maybe accomplish that of getting 30 different plants in seven days, a really good way to um, you know, experience some, some new fruits and vegetables possibly, and um, include those foods that, as we said, have had a lot of um, benefits um, with the gut microbiome and improving that, that diversity um, within our gut. Are canned or frozen fruits and vegetables equivalent to the fresh ones as far as fiber that you're getting? Yeah, yeah, they are. Um, they are definitely going to be a really good source of fiber, particularly the frozen um, fruits and vegetables. Those are typically frozen right after they're picked, so they're really going to be at, at peak in terms of nutrients. Um, the canned foods may not have quite as amount of fiber, high amounts of fiber, because they've gone through a cooking process, but are still going to be a really good source of it. Um, so definitely something you know to include. Um, you know, our concern a lot of times with canned food is the higher amounts of sodium. So making sure that you're trying to purchase ones that either have no salt added or um, are low sodium is a way to um, reduce that, that added um, sodium that we might have with the canned foods. Um, and then with the frozen foods, just making sure that they don't have any added salt or um, sugar. Um, surprisingly enough, in many cases, they can have sugar added to them as well. So that's going to be the only things we want to keep an eye out for with either the frozen or the canned foods. It's still a really good source of fiber. So this is just kind of showing you um, a little bit of a variety um, in different types of fiber. So uh, uh, talking about some of those um, uh, different fiber types, such as the viscous, fermentable, or insoluble um, fibers. So some examples of those whole grains, the barley, oatmeal, oat um, bran are going to be some examples of, of the viscous type, um, different types of vegetables, fruits, um, beans and legumes. So you can kind of see um, a little bit of an overlap there. So barley, you know, that's uh, got several different types of fiber there, um, and it's going to provide a lot of, of those benefits. Um, kind of the point of this is just showing you to increase the amount and variety of fiber within your diet. So we can get it from so many different sources there. Um, and by trying to choose different types of vegetables, different types of fruits, um, having nuts and seeds, you know, in your diet, that's going to be a way to get a lot of variety um, from all different types of fiber. So talking about reading a nutrition facts label in terms of fiber, um, the, the dietary um, fiber daily value is, is based on a um, 2,000 calorie diet. So it's listed as, as 28 grams for kind of your, your um, daily amount there. Um, so that's where we kind of get that percentage. Now, not everyone is going to be on a 2,000 calorie diet. But a rule of thumb is to always try to pick ones in terms of fiber that are closer to 20% of the percentage daily value. And that's that, that little percentage you're seeing is a little small here, but that, that's that percentage you're seeing here on the side of the nutrition facts label. So you see here this um, dietary fiber of seven grams is 18%. Um, we always want to try to get fiber closer to 20%. Um, if it's closer to 5%, that's low, and we want it to be higher. So 20% is going to be um, kind of our, our goal for that, that fiber. So we had talked about that breakfast cereal earlier and trying to get at least 5 grams of fiber. This um, example would be a really great source of dietary fiber with that 7 grams in there. So always something you're going to want to take a look at, um, always wanting to keep that, that um, percentage daily value closer to 20% for fiber, um, and then also trying to think about some of those things that we want to be lower, such as saturated fat or sodium, closer to 5%. So just kind of a quick and easy way to look at those labels and determine if this food is going to be beneficial for you um, in terms of the, those beneficial things like fiber. So just some general tips of adding a little more fiber to your diet. Um, as we've talked a lot about already, um, the increase of plant-based foods, such as the fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, and beans and legumes. Um, just working on having more of those within your diet is going to be a great first step. Um, try to include a whole grain at every meal. So maybe some oatmeal at breakfast, some quinoa at lunch. You know, we, we looked at some examples of that earlier. When we have things like fruit juices, we lose out on the fiber. When, when a, a you know, apple is juice, it, it takes all the juice out of it, and that pulp where the fiber is is thrown out. So by eating whole fruits, like the actual apple instead of the juice, you're going to get that benefit of fiber. 
trying to use whole wheat flour in your cooking and baking when possible. And if you've got a great recipe for something that calls for all-purpose flour, you can generally substitute about 50% of the flour for whole wheat. So if it was one cup of flour, you could do half a cup of whole wheat, half a cup of all-purpose flour, and that's going to be a way to increase um, the fiber from that whole wheat flour in the recipe without affecting the results um, too significantly. And then try to eat at least five servings of fruits and vegetables each day. Um, we're going to get a, a little bit higher fiber in, in fresh fruit than canned. Um, so having, you know, again, the apple instead of um, the apple sauce is going to increase it a little bit more. Um, it's also going to provide that peel, which is going to be um, more fiber and more insoluble fiber in particular. And then some more tips um, on adding fiber, kind of drilling down a little bit more, um, re replacing some of that white rice, um, white bread, um, white pasta with more um, whole grains. So doing brown rice or some of those other whole grains like barley. Um, millet is similar to quinoa in that it's a seed, um, but it's definitely a, a good source of fiber, um, also a good source of plant protein. Um, Amaranth and farro are um, some of those more ancient grains is, is how they're often labeled in the grocery store, um, but very similar in, in terms of serving to rice. Um, so it can be a really nice substitute for that and just give you a little more variety. You can also just add fiber to your current meals. Um, that, that's an easy way to boost that fiber content without you know, having to come up with new recipes and, and, and new ways of doing things. So adding a couple tablespoons of almonds, some ground flax seeds, oat bran, wheat germ, or chia seeds to your cereal, to your yogurt, um, adding more vegetables to your casseroles or stir fry dishes, tacos, soups, any of those types of things is gonna be a great way to add more fiber. We talked about the cereal a little bit, and again, shooting for that five grams of fiber per serving or 20% of the daily value at least. When you're thinking about snacks, um, we often think about, you know, having maybe some chips or crackers for a snack. Think about having fruits or vegetables, um, maybe having some raw vegetables like some carrots or cucumbers, um, having a handful of almonds um, instead of those chips or crackers. And when you do have the crackers, try to choose something like a whole grain. Um, Triscuits are a whole grain. Um, the Wasa brand of crackers, um, those are also going to be a good um, whole grain cracker. So that can be a nice way to boost the fiber with, with um, you know, something like cheese and crackers. And then trying to do more plant-based meals, um, having beans or legumes like chickpeas um, instead of meat, you know, maybe once or twice a week, um, having more chilies or soups that are going to have those beans and legumes in them is a good way to increase fiber in your diet. So again, just adding some of those nuts and seeds to foods. Um, give you a little example here, adding um, one tablespoon of chia seeds, half a cup of chopped walnuts, and a half a cup of raspberries is going to give you an extra 10 grams of fiber in, in a, a bowl of um, plain oatmeal. So that's really going to just um, increase it significantly. By changing some of the um, lettuce in your salad at lunch, by you know using about half of it um, kale instead of all romaine lettuce, and then adding some um, chopped or sliced Brussels sprouts to it, and then um, subbing some of the animal protein like chicken for um, chickpeas would add about nine grams of fiber to a salad. And then dinner, substituting white rice for one of those whole grains is going to double the fiber and increase the protein. So just to give you a few examples there, um, a cup of white rice is going to be about 0.6 grams of fiber, whereas farro is going to be 11 grams for one cup, barley 6 grams, and bulgur about 8.2 grams. So much, much higher amounts of fiber um, in, in those um, whole grains there, and that's going to be a really good way to increase the fiber in your diet. And then a couple more snack ideas. Um, doing something like um, air pop popcorn is going to give you six grams of fibers for three cups versus um, one of those little bags of Lay's is only going to give you one gram of fiber. Using something like um, jicama in hummus would be six grams of fiber, and that's compared to only three grams if you're doing something like cucumbers and ranch dressing. So hummus is a really great source of fiber because, of course, it's made from chickpeas. Um, so that's always something to think about, just swapping out your, your dip is going to be a really good way to increase fiber. And then having something like edamame, which is um, a type of uh, young soybeans. Um, that's going to be four grams of fiber versus one gram, something like a, a Nutri-Grain bar, a cereal bar. So those are all ways you can just increase that fiber in your diet um, by swapping out some of those foods um, for higher fiber substitutes. So I know we had a question earlier about the, the fiber supplements. Um, 
you know, as a dietitian, you know, I certainly recommend trying to get your fiber through your foods as much as possible. But if you found that it's really difficult to do that, um, sometimes a supplement can be helpful. Um, psyllium is going to come in products like Metamucil. That's going to be the source of fiber there. Um, something like the Benefiber is coming from wheat dextrin. So that's uh, you know, one difference between those two. It's just a different type of fiber. Um, and the, the um, amount of soluble fiber is a little bit higher in Benefiber versus Metamucil, not really significantly, but um, um, it really mainly is higher because it's a larger serving size. Um, one teaspoon versus two teaspoons there, but just a different type of fiber in there, um, both sources of soluble fiber. So those are just a few examples of different ways to get um, some of those um, fiber substitutes in your diet. Um, we get more benefits getting from food because the food is also going to provide other benefits. So, you know, it's going to provide perhaps some plant-based protein and it's going to provide some vitamins and minerals, you know, from those, those different plant foods, whereas the, the fiber supplement is really just giving you that straight up fiber and that's it. Um, so trying to, you know, really get our fiber as much as possible from foods. And if we need a little bit of help, there's certainly a number of, of fiber supplements um, and, and always, you know, discussing those with your doctor before you start on anything like that, just to make sure that that's appropriate for you. So reducing some of the side effects of fiber, um, as we discussed a little bit earlier, um, having too much fiber, particularly too quickly in your diet, can cause some gastrointestinal side effects. Um, those are often things like bloating, gas, um, abdominal pain. So to reduce those potential um, adverse effects, we want to increase fiber slowly. Um, I often recommend starting with just one meal, saying, okay, let me work on breakfast. I'm going to try to add you know, some of those chia seeds and almonds to my oatmeal or my cereal um, and just kind of give that a little bit of time. Um, because of the absorption of water, particularly by insoluble fiber, we really want to make sure we're having adequate fluid. Um, so really making sure you're getting plenty of water throughout the day will help reduce some of those um, abdominal side effects. Increasing exercise, particularly having some activity after meals, can help reduce some of those um, uh, gastrointestinal side effects. And then trying to do more, quote unquote, natural fibers. So that's going to be the fiber um, found in, in foods. One issue with the supplements or doing a lot of um, the functional fibers, like those protein bars, is you have a very high amounts of those, it really increases that um, amount of the gastrointestinal um, side effects. So trying to do, again, more from the foods, and if you are doing some of the supplements, making sure you're kind of starting at a very slow dose for those um, and not starting too high too quickly, because um, that's going to really cause more side effects in those cases. So just a common questions I often get about fiber I thought I would address, and we can certainly address any other questions that might come up. Um, often want to know, well, what about cooking? It, it, should I eat raw broccoli instead of cooked broccoli because there's going to be more fiber in it? Um, cooking your fruits and vegetables does not really alter the fiber content to, to any significance. Um, and in, in some vegetables, such as tomatoes, cooking them is actually beneficial. It helps us absorb some of those um, phytochemicals or those nutrients that we get from those um, fruits and vegetables. So that, in some cases, can be actually beneficial to cook them. But it's really not going to alter the fiber content um, in any significant way. So you don't need to worry about that. You might have seen advertisements or, for some of the um, green powders, like AG1, um, that, that's sort of a supplemental food. Um, you are going to get some fiber from some of those powder supplements, um, those kind of vegetable drinks. But they are really not a substitute um, for whole foods. You're not going to get as much fiber, for one. That's going to be one negative about it. Um, you're not going to get the water content, um, so that's going to actually be a good source of fluids in our diet from many of those foods um, with the powdered supplement. And we, I often say Mother Nature is, is, is really smart and basically packages things in such a way that one nutrient within a food is going to help you with absorption of another nutrient that's found in the same food. So by having those whole foods, you're going to um, get that what we call bioavailability, which basically means your body's going to absorb those nutrients better because of the way that that um, plant food is packaged um, to help um, in increase that. With the supplements, that's not often the case. They're kind of isolated, so we're not going to get that bioavailability. You may not absorb those nutrients um, as well. And then we also get, um, because of the higher fiber content and um, just, you know, kind of the whole process of chewing and swallowing and digesting, we're not going to get that benefit of the satiety um, keeping us full. So that's going to be another thing to think about um, within those whole foods. 
So do some type of fibers have worse side effects? Um, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but some um, carbohydrates are high in what we call FODMAPs. FODMAPs are just a, a way of classifying different types of carbohydrates, particularly fermentable fibers. Those FODMAP foods can cause um, gastrointestinal um, distress in some people, um, particularly people who have IBS. So that would be a case to, um, if, you, if you think you have that or you've been diagnosed with IBS, you know, to work with your gastroenterologist and possibly a, a registered dietitian, um, because we can really help you identify, you know, which foods are causing problems. It's kind of a, a, an elimination diet where we slowly add back some of those foods and assess the results. Um, so that can be a case where you, you, you know, really want to work with someone who's a bit more educated and what those fermentable fibers are and what the effects are um, on the body and how we can um, keep the, the diet as diverse as possible, but reduce some of those gastrointestinal side effects. And then finally, for someone on a low fiber, low residue diet, um, that might be related to um, diverticulosis or some other health conditions. Um, so there might be a concern that like, okay, well, is this bad? You know, we just said that you need to have lots of fiber in your diet and that's gonna help reduce the risk of things like colorectal cancer. You know, what, what should I do in that case? So we really wanna think about um, more the physical form of fiber in those cases um, with something like, um, you know, uh, IBD, intestinal bowel disease, or with um, uh, diverticulosis, we might be able to still have some of these fruits and vegetables just in a different form. So we might be able to tolerate some of those higher fiber foods if they're blended or pureed in something like a smoothie. Um, so we're still going to get those benefits. It's just going to help reduce some of, of the work on the digestive tract. Um, and, and again, some of those um, issues that we might have as far as flare ups with something like um, diverticulosis. So that again can be a case of working with a dietitian to help you make some modifications to your diet so that you're still getting benefits even if you have to be on more of a, a lower fiber diet. All right, so just kind of wrapping up with a fiber spotlight, talking a little bit about beans. Um, beans are a source of both soluble and insoluble fiber. In general, they're going to provide about seven or more grams of dietary fiber per half cup serving. So again, a, a lot of bang for your buck there. Um, they're also high in antioxidants, which can help with reducing inflammation and um, other health benefits, particularly in the colored beans, so like the red, black, and brown beans. It's a great plant-based protein. So um, we're getting some protein from these foods, um, even though they're not a meat or a fish type of thing. And then beans are also gonna provide many minerals like potassium, magnesium, and iron um, at a very low cost compared to some of those more protein-rich animal foods. So just some tips if you wanna work on adding a little more beans to your diet, um, adding a neutralizer um, such as uh, lemon juice, apple cider vinegar, or baking soda to beans when they're soaking is gonna help reduce the cooking time and soften the skin. That can also help re reduce some of those um, gas promoting side effects that we have with beans. Um, so that, that's one way to you know, shorten that cooking time if you're using dried beans and also reduce some of those side effects. We wanna store dried beans in an airtight Cool, uh, airtight container in a cool place for up to one year. And if you're using canned beans, which is you know, a really great option, very convenient, um, trying to buy the low sodium options um, or rinsing them. And that's gonna reduce the sodium by about a third if you rinse them in water prior to using them. So by soaking um, beans in hot water before cooking them for about two to three minutes, that's gonna help um, reduce some of those gas promoting compounds that we find. The longer the beans soak, the more those compounds are gonna be reduced. Um, so doing a soak overnight can help really reduce um, some of those side effects. And then for some people, even taking um, a digestive enzyme such as Beano can um, really help with some of those, those gastrointestinal side effects that we might note from having um, different types of beans. When cooking beans, try to do just one type. Um, we've got different cooking times for different types of beans. So sometimes you're gonna end up with one that's overcooked and one that's undercooked if you're mixing them. So trying to stick with just one at a time. And then you can even add things like pureed beans, pureed black beans, for example, in cooking um, to help reduce the, the fat content. So adding you know, um, a, about half the amount of pureed black beans to a brownie mix, um, which might sound a little odd, um, but it's actually quite tasty, um, is gonna help um, increase the protein in that dish, and it's also gonna help increase the fiber in it um, while reducing the fat. So that can be a, a good way to um, make those brownies a little bit healthier. 
couple cooking ideas on some beans. So a, a real easy white bean dip, just taking some cannellini beans, a clove of garlic, a little bit of olive oil, some lemon juice, and then some um, fresh parsley. Put that in a food processor, pulse it until it's smooth, maybe a little salt and pepper, and you've got yourself a really nice um, alternative to, to hummus there. Um, split peas, nice thing to snack on. Um, you can take some of those soaked split peas, put them in a skillet with some olive oil, add some um, seasoning after they've gotten golden brown and crunchy, and that's going to be kind of a nice healthy high fiber snack. And then just a really easy black bean soup, um, adding a couple cups of black beans to some lime, cilantro, shallots, a little bit of cumin and some cayenne, maybe some salt and pepper, and you've got yourself a, a quick and easy black bean soup for dinner. So all really good sources of um, the, that fiber um, and things you can do in, in pretty um, short, short time frame as well. All right, so just a few takeaways. Um, we've got two types of um, fiber, both soluble and insoluble, but many foods contain both types. And we don't want to concern ourselves too much with, you know, which is better. It's more both are going to have beneficial health effects. Um, so by having a very diverse diet, having lots of those plant foods in our diet is going to give us adequate amounts of, of all types of fiber. Um, fiber in our diet has lots of benefits. It helps reduce that, the bad cholesterol or your LDL. It helps reduce the risk for heart disease and colon cancer. It can help with improving blood sugar control and help with keeping you full. Recommendations for fiber are 20, 25 grams um, per day for women, 30 grams for men. And when we're adding fiber to our diet, we want to do that slowly with lots of fluid. That's going to help reduce some of those um, gastrointestinal side effects. And then finally, um, a great way to add more fiber, uh, particularly in a cost-effective way, is to add more of those beans to your diet. So any kind of beans are a great source of fiber, black beans, white beans, uh, lentils as well. Um, so that's a really great high fiber food, um, which is also going to provide some of those, those plant proteins as well. All right, so that is all I had. Any other questions that I can answer yes. in the last you, you talked about trying to do the uh, 30 in seven days. This one person said he's been buying uh, baby spring mix, which has a variety of different leaves. Does each different leaf count as one of the 30? It does. It absolutely does. Yeah, because you're, you're talking about two or three, four, I don't even know how many are in there, um, different plant foods. So it absolutely does. And like I said before, you can even count things like that cilantro we're putting um, uh, on our beans. You count the garlic, cloves that you're having. Those are all plant-based foods. Um, so they definitely all count. So, you know, it's just a great way to kind of assess your diet. I think even in things sometimes, um, you know, a salad, we, we sort of get in a rut and we just sort of always use romaine lettuce day after day after day. So just switching that up a little bit and saying, okay, well, let me do some, some kale this week or some baby spinach or some arugula or, or whatever um, is going to be a great way to diversify that diet, increase that amount of plant foods. You've mentioned ground flax seeds several times. Should this this person wants to know if they are going to be eating pumpkin seeds, should they grind those as well, or can they just eat them whole? You can eat those whole. Um, uh, flaxseed is a little bit unique in that our bodies do not absorb them whole. Um, just kind of pass right through us <laughs> because of, of that uh, higher amounts of insoluble fiber. So that is something where you do want to purchase um, the flax seeds ground. You can also get things like um, a flax seed oil, um, which isn't going to have really the fiber in it, but it's going to have some of the benefits of it. Um, other uh, types of seeds like the chia seeds or, you know, the pumpkin seeds that you mentioned, sunflower seeds, those can be eaten whole. You, you still are going to get the benefits um, and be able to absorb those um, whole. Okay. There are lots of different kinds of oatmeal, of oats available is there any difference between rolled oats, quick oats, instant oats, regular oatmeal made on the stove as far as the fiber content? Right. So, so the, the oats that you find, um, it basically has to do just with the processing of the oats. So if you think of the steel cut oats, um, it, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's just they're using um, kind of a device to cut it um, in, in sort of a flat way. Um, and, and that's um, kind of what you end up with is this um, kind of flat type of oat. And then you have your rolled oats. Those are, are basically processed a little bit more. So they're a little um, thinner, cook faster. And then the ones in the packets are the ones that have been processed the most. 
um, in terms of breaking down that kind of oat um, germ there. So there's not a significant amount um, a difference in fiber. There, there is some difference, um, but not a significant amount. It really goes more toward um, the cooking time, whereas the, you know, the packets are going to cook much faster than something like the steel cut oats there. Um, I would say there's a little bit of preference. I mean, a lot of people will tell me that they find that the steel cut oats just you know much more satisfying and tastier and just kind right. of a better end product. Um, so, so it kind of depends on your preference there, but certainly in, in terms of time, you know, the, the, the little packets of the plain oatmeal are going to be the quickest um, cooking and still going to provide a pretty good source of soluble fiber. All right. Next question is, uh, do you know how long dried quinoa will keep? Um, I cannot probably give you a specific number on that. I mean, I will say that many of those whole grains do tend to spoil faster um, because, again, just ha have more um, oil in them and, and more uh, of that um, whole grain in there. So those are ones that, you know, I, I, I would don't know the exact number, but I'm going to guess probably no more than, you know, maybe three or four months um, before those are going to start to, to start turn bad. So a lot of people will keep the, their um, whole grains or even things like nuts and seeds in the refrigerator just to kind of prolong that, that shelf life. Okay. You've mentioned almonds a number of times. What about other nuts? Are they all more or less equally good sources of fiber or any that yeah. are particularly bad? Yeah, no, they are all great sources of fiber. Um, you know, it is, again, something where it's nice to have a variety in your diet. Um, with, um, you know, having the same type of nuts, you're kind of getting the same type of, you know, vitamins and minerals over and over again. So it's good to, you know, maybe mix it up a little bit and sometimes having some walnuts if you tend to gear toward almonds all the time or pecans or um, pistachios or anything like that. But they're all going to um, be, be a pretty good source of fiber in them. Um, so, so, you know, certainly having good variety in there is beneficial. Okay. Is there any fiber in veggie patties? So, so uh, like the frozen ones, yeah. um, I think what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So those are typically made with some type of um, soy. So soy is going to have um, some fiber in that from the soybean um, there. They're definitely going to have more fiber than you're going to find, of course, in a, you know, meat, <laughs> you know, an actual uh, veggie or an actual uh, uh, burger um, made from, from beef. Um, they're probably not going to have as much fiber as one that you can make on your own. So I'm just thinking I made some um, little veggie burgers um, over this past weekend and mine had black beans in them and sweet potatoes and um, it was supposed to be quinoa, but I actually substituted farro because it's just what I had um, and a little bit of oats in there to kind of make it all stick together. So, so I think, um, you know, the, those ones you buy in the grocery store are going to have some fiber, but you certainly can boost it and add more by making those um, on your own. Um, um, and also going to probably going to give you a little less sodium and some of those things we might be trying to reduce. And uh, question is, what is the shelf life of 100% wild rice? Yeah, I'm afraid I, I don't want to give any numbers on that because I am not absolutely sure of what it would be. I mean, generally with those things, you're going to want to store them in some type of air kite container um, in, you know, a dark, cool place, just like we were talking about with the beans. And um, I, I'm going to guess probably no more than, you know, three or four months, but that probably would, you know, maybe take a look at the back of the package and might tell you a more precise number on that. Yeah, I, she's got a follow-up comment that she's keeping it in the freezer, so. Yeah, that would definitely, yeah, it would absolutely. Last a lot longer. That would definitely prolong it, absolutely. Okay, I don't see any more questions and we are a little bit past 11 o'clock okay well so yes i was just meant noticing that as we are at 1104 so wow lisa i'm sure everybody was taking lots of notes and it's a good thing that gary was uh um recording this because i think people will go back and um take advantage of all of the information. So thank you so much. This was a excellent, excellent presentation by Lisa Murez, diabetes educator at Virginia Hospital Center. So um, next week we have something totally different on Wednesday, April 3rd. Um, and I think Liz put something in the chat about that. Our guest will be author Lawrence McDonald, who will, uh, 
who is a uh, wrote something called A Boomer's Guide to Climate Action. So explaining why baby boomers may be key actors in the effort to mitigate the effects of global warming. So I think that will be an interesting um, topic to discuss. We can use and um, so um, with that, we will say goodbye to everybody today and um, see you next week at the same time and the same station, so to speak. And um, have a good week and a good weekend. Thanks, everyone. Take care.